live from Liverpool, we need to talk about ghosts with Kevin Eustace. Yes, it's Sunday. It's time for the Sunday Sermon. We are back in normality. Um, I Thank you for the feedback, by the way, about the Patreon episode we put out last week for the Standard Feed. People seem to like it. They found it rather humorous. And yes, it was humorous. Thank you very much, if I do say so myself. A um, lot less stress this week. The whole event situation is done with. You may have seen it in the news, actually. We were responsible for three of the first, after the Wembley Cup final thing, um, non-socially distanced musical events. And they took place in Liverpool our team were responsible for the ticketing of the event, and it went relatively smoothly. Although it was very stressful, there was a lot of work. But thank you for all your messages about sticking up, uh, sticking up about getting through it and all that, Karen. You're very supportive. You're a lovely bunch, as I've said many a time before. But here we are. It is Sunday. Things have returned to normality, and it's time to get a little bit spooked. If you can hear background tinkering, what's going on is Becca is cooking her lunch. Say hello, Becca. She said, sorry, what are you cooking? Um, it's pesto mushrooms. Pesto mushrooms. Pesto mushrooms and salad. And uh, do you like it? Yeah. Yeah? It's tasty. It's tasty? If you say so yourself? Do you, are you having that every day this week? Do you not get a bit bored? No, you've got to offset the boredom with the amount of effort it would take to plan and prep and buy Five separate meals for lunch. Okay. So Becca is saying basically, if you can't hear her, she's basically saying you've got to offset the boredom against how hard it would be to plan several different things. Um, but you probably had dead air there. No, no, I'm pretty sure you'll pick some of it up. Anyway, enough about Becca and her boring dinners. Ha <laughs> um, ha We do have a fantastic episode for you. We really sincerely do. And of course. I've just recorded uh, a Patreon episode for our wonderful Patreons. On Patreon this week, we're going to be discussing La Llorona. Yes, we are. And it was a good episode. I enjoyed doing it. So if you want to find out what went on in that episode, you need to sign up to Patreon. So you need to go over to patreon.com forward slash we need to talk about ghosts. Yes, you do. And a lot of people have done that recently. I say a lot. There's a few. And I'm going to sing them a song because when you sign up to Patreon, not only do you get two, yes, two extra episodes each and every week. I made that sound far too dramatic, didn't I? But you do. Um, you also get your name sung out as a thank you by little old me. So I'm going to do that now because last week we didn't get the chance to do it, of course. But this week I'm going to sing some names who've been lucky, lucky enough, how very dare I, who I'm very thankful to for signing up to Patreon. And those people are Jamie Deeks, Barbara Steving, The Marlena Effect, Giles Sinclair, Melissa Frank, Jova and Ian Higgs. Seven wonderful new Patreons. I'm telling you guys, you're missing out if you're not a Patreon. It's all going off over there twice weekly. Get over to patreon.com. We need to talk about ghosts. But these seven guys I need to somehow fit into a musical thank you song. Good Lord Kevin, the more popular the show gets, the harder these become. It will end up being a rap. I'm telling you, it really will. But it's not going to be today. No, no, no. I will fit these names in. For I have the guitar out. Yes, I do. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Ian Hicks, Jover, and Melissa Frank, Giles Sinclair, and Jamie Deeks. I want to say thank you I want to say thank you Not forgetting please Barbara Steving And the Marlena effect You're all patrons And what you'll expect To get an extra episode, yeah Get an extra episode. Ah, oh, I didn't end it on a seventh. Wait there. I ended it on a seventh. Oh, I kind of tailed off towards the end. But I really enjoyed that tune. I might make that into a proper song. What do you think, guys? Should I? I mean, not with those lyrics. That would be weird. Although you could kind of claim copyright at some point. 
what an extra that would be. Be like, you know, sign up to Patreon and get your name copyrighted in a song. Anyway, thank you once again to Ian Higgs, Jova, Melissa Frank, Charles Sinclair, Jamie Deeks, Barbara Steving, and the Molina Effect. I love you all. That's fantastic news. Great stuff. So once again, if you want to treble your We Need to Talk About Ghost input, then you just need to go over to patreon.com forward slash we need to talk about ghost. And you can do so each and every week. Three episodes in total you will get, including this one. Yes, you will. Anyway, shall we look at what weird things have been happening in our wonderful world in the last seven days? Yes, Kevin, we shall. Very good, Kevin. We can Yes, after a lengthy layoff, it's time once more to look at what weird and wonderful things have been taking place in our place that we call the world in the last seven days. So, you may have seen this because it went viral via the masculine nonsense that is Lad Bible recently, and a tour guide in the Croatian city of Zagreb spotted that a person sitting at a bus stop, or standing at a bus stop, sorry, could have been a ghost, and he took a photo of it. So basically, and I'm reading verbatim from Lad Bible here, a tour guide got the fright of his life when he spotted what appeared to be a ghost waiting at the bus stop. Of course, why exactly a spectral being would need to use public transport is anyone's guess. But Ivan Rubel, a tour guide in the Croatian capital Zagreb, spotted that the person hanging around waiting for the bus had see-through legs. And on the picture, to be fair, you can see that there's like a white line which is on the floor, like a floor marking for the bus stop. And you can see it going through her legs, you can see it right through. But is it just a malfunction of the camera or some sort of digital archetype? Maybe. Rubel's job as a tour guide sees him taking Brits, amongst others, on tours of the city, including some of the haunted locations. However, this time, it was him that got a spooking as he captured the strange figure on camera. The 30-year-old took the photograph because he spotted two nuns at the bus stop and thought they looked like bus conductors. Thinking he'd get a funny photo... I mean, it's not that funny, is it? Taking a photo of two nuns. It's actually quite offensive, Rubel. Anyway, he pulled out his camera. However, upon closer inspection, the apparition was also revealed, as the woman in a brown coat that was also waiting had transparent legs, meaning that he could see the bus stop line through them. Since he shared the photo, loads of people have commented on the strange nature of the photo. Some think it's a trick of the camera, but others think it's something more. Ivan explained, So I've uploaded the photo to Facebook, and one of my friends commented, There's a ghost on your photo. I didn't see it for at least 15 or 20 minutes, but then I saw it. I'm not being funny, mate. It's the centre of the photo. You need to get yourself to spec savers. For a few hours after it was pointed out, I was taken aback. I've gotten some complaints that it was just my camera, but I've tried to take similar photos and I've not gotten the same effect. I'm not sure it was a ghost, but it's definitely fun, he says. I think ultimately, I do agree with people who say it was a mistake of the camera, but it's not easy to explain. I don't believe in the supernatural, but when you have evidence like this, I cannot be so sure. I'm keen to believe, but I'm not so sure. I would say I'm agnostic. He captioned the original snap. I took this photo because it was interesting how two nuns look like they're going to enter the bus and check everyone's tickets. <laughs> Much later, I did realize the woman in the brown coat could be a ghost. And then he goes on in the article to advertise his tour. So is it all just an advertising ruse? Possibly, but it is a bit of a weird photo. Nevertheless, that's been this week's Week in Weird. Week in Weird. And we are back. And we're going to jump right into the spook. We've had an email here, and it's called Haunted Riding Stables and Ongoing Happenings at Home. Hmm. This person has asked to remain anonymous, and we're going to grant that request because we're nice people. Hi, Kev. Hi. Hi, Becca. Do you want to say hi? Hi. Aw. Hi, Matt. Does Matt get another mention? And he doesn't like this. That's Matt from Full Movie Podcast, by the way. Um, I'll do Matt. Hi, Matt. Oh, oi. <laughs> Terrible Cockney accent. And the neighbor's cat. Could you please keep me... Oh, sorry. And the neighbor's cat. Meow. Could you please keep me anonymous? Thank you. Yes, I will. I love your show and I've spent hours binge listening to your podcasts at work. Oh, I've now gotten through them all and signed up to Patreon because I simply can't get enough. 
and then four exclamation marks. Not my words, people. The words of Anonymous. Thank you for that. Anyway, I've been debating with myself whether to send in my different paranormal experiences that happened at the riding stables I used to keep my horses and work at. As a bit of background, the riding stables used to be an old World War I hangar and do in fact have an unmarked mass burial site below the ground somewhere. Jesus, tonight, that's terrifying. I mean, I know that, like, the history of the world, probably everywhere's got people buried under it, but a mass burial site, no thank you gladly. Anyway, this is Anonymous's story. The first story started when I was helping lead a horsey-themed birthday party in a caravan we had on site. I was about 14 or 15 at the time. I was drawing something on a whiteboard we had to try and explain something to the children about the horses. I'm pretty sure it was a game of hangman just before the party ended. Pretty soon the parents came to pick up their children and we never finished the game. So I got the children and their belongings together and we left the caravan, locking it behind me. I went home for the day and thought nothing more of it. I returned the next morning and opened up the caravan to find that the word underneath the hangman had been written on the board, spelling out dead, and the hangman had been completely drawn as a young girl with crosses over her eyes. I was the only one who had keys to that caravan. That is abysmal. That's terrifying. The crosses for eyes bit is terrifying too, because I happen to know from personal experience that there's several spells, like dark magic spells that you can do, where you require a photograph of the person who's going to be affected by the spell. And crossing their eyes out is an act you do on that, just so you know. Beck is looking at me now as in to say, when did you do the spell and should I expect an injury sometime soon? No, it wasn't you. I should think not. Well, it wasn't. Why would you think I think it was me? Um, because you're naughty. Um, but it did work, just in case anyone's caring. If anyone wants Who to know that spell. Sorry? Who did it injure? It didn't injure anyone. It just resolved the situation. And if anyone wants to know how to do that spell, um, just let me know. Anyway, so this is the next story from Anonymous. Another story from the yard. I was brushing one of the horses about 20 feet away from the caravan when I got an overwhelming urge to look up at the caravan. I tried to avoid it as much as I could as I got a very creepy vibe. As I looked up, one of the side windows began to fog over completely like someone was breathing on it. As the fog cleared, I saw the face of an elderly man looking directly at me. Again, I was the only one who had keys to the caravan. Then I felt a presence behind me and someone breathing down my neck. I spun round so quick there was no one there. When I looked back over to the caravan, the face was gone. Hmm, that is terrifying. It reminds me, actually, that um, I think it might be Nukes. You know, a bang on about Nukes Top 5 on YouTube. One of his recent ones, or was it Frostmare? Check out both of those sites on YouTube, Frostmare and Nukes Top 5. One of them recently has got an amazing video on. It's a guy who works on a railway, like in a suburban city, and he's down in the tunnels and he's walking past a turned off train like isn't it just in the station shunted up like not being used and he's walking past to go to his mates and he's filming his mates or whatever and in the corner you see a face pressed up against the glass and there should be no one in there oh it's terrifying just got a chill thinking about it anyway the stories don't stop there for anonymous so here's the third one a few nights later i was taking my horse down to the field at night about 9 30 p.m so it was dark outside as I was walking down, I saw a strange light that almost appeared to be bouncing up and down, but staying in the same spot. I called out and asked if anyone was there, and I had no response. As I passed it, it faded and another one appeared, and it kept happening until I got to this little dip in the pathway, and then I felt the presence behind me again, but this time it was warm. And then, out of nowhere, with no one around, I heard a lady humming behind me. She followed me down the rest of the way and was with me whilst I released my horse and then back to the dip in the path, which was about halfway to the field. I didn't feel scared or uneasy and it almost felt like she was protecting me or even trying to distract me from something else. 
I then left the yard a couple of weeks later as the management of the riding stables was changed very, very suddenly. I sold my horse and I haven't been back there since. Interesting. The idea that a spirit can come on and protect you from another spirit. Didn't we touch on that last week? Um, not last week, so the week before. The idea of a, a like spirit bullying each other in a haunted house. Wasn't the one about an overriding presence of an evil man and he seemed to be neglecting the woman oh no i'll tell you what it was it was um the if you listen go and listen to the dark paranormal season finale for season two it was Borley rectory that we covered and in there there's an idea that there's an overriding evil man spirit and he's kind of um keeping the female spirit like trapped within there like a, you wouldn't think it would you? you just think once you're a ghost you're a ghost go about your day but um no apparently bullying happens in the afterlife that's bloody awful isn't it so here's another story from Anonymous. In terms of my ongoing experience, I live in a very old house from the Elizabethan times and my mum and dad bought it when I was about six months old. My mum used to tell me that when I was little, I used to laugh and talk to the walls. But as I was a child, I thought nothing of it and assumed it was an imaginary friend. More recently, my mum has told me that the previous owner of the house used to only ever live in two rooms downstairs and refused to go upstairs. I've never got a bad feeling in my house and I've always felt very warm and welcome. More recently, things have started to change, though. I'm hoping to move out soon and I'm starting to think the spirit or whatever is in my house might have become attached to me and maybe doesn't want me to move, if that's even possible. I have recently started having some more activity with my lights flickering very, very aggressively. But when I ask it to stop, you guessed it, it stops on command. And this happens daily. I downloaded an app on my phone that supposedly allows you to communicate with ghosts. And all the messages seem to be are don't go and stay and home. They might be nothing, but almost seem too relevant to the situation. Me and my boyfriend were also sat downstairs the other day and very, very, very clearly heard a very heavy footed person walking across the landing which spans from one side of the house to the other. And they were leading to the back bedroom, which I've always kind of got a strange, not scary, just strange vibe from. As well as this, I've also been hearing some scratching underneath my bed, like someone is underneath it. Finally, I had a very vivid dream the other night about my house. We have no history on the house, and neither does the estate agent. I dreamt that the previous owner's wife hung herself in the back bedroom, we have no idea if this is true or not, but I sure dreamt it. Anyway, that's all I have for now, and please let me know if you'd like to hear more. Your show is amazing and I love it. Please never stop. Best wishes, Anony Mouse. Why, thank you, Anonymous. What a lovely way to sign off an email. But, oh, my living Christ, you do need to move. And if it continues, you need to invite Kevin Beck around. Yes, you do. We've already got one person. Um, I think we're going to arrange to go and do a vigil for for Halloween. In a genuine haunted house, you know, we're not the new, I'm not saying that we're the new Ed and Lorraine Warren, but we're the new Ed and Lorraine Warren, okay? Yeah, yeah, and we're going to make Hollywood blockbusters and lie through our teeth, just like the original Ed and Lorraine. God, I've proper got a beamy bonnet about Ed and Lorraine, haven't I? They're both dead, I should just take it easy. Anyway, thank you, Anonymous. What a wonderful series of things. Now, Anonymous also got back in touch and shared a video with me that... She said it just for my eyes, and it's um, it's a video of the lights going on and off in her living room, and she's clearly not controlling it because she's doing like a selfie stick thing with the camera. I'm not saying it couldn't be faked, but why would you? Especially when she's literally saying, you know, don't give me name out, don't share this video, it's just for you. And it's quite eerie, but she also says within that email where she shared the video, um, I forgot to put things in, da -da 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 -da. I prefer if you didn't share the video, fine. It's also worth mentioning I do practice witchcraft and use everything from potion jars to crystals to tarot cards and moon oracle cards. Now, the devout spiritualist people out there and religious people will be saying, are you bringing this on yourself? Have you conjured something? If you're doing divination, are you opening a portal and you're allowing these things in? And I don't know, maybe you are. But as someone who has tried divination all his life, at least thrice a year since the age of 10 um i can safely say more than likely not 
and more than likely there's just something in your house that you haven't conjured up. Let's hope so anyway, Anonymous. Now, as I've said many, many times before, I don't like to pre-read these stories that I'm telling you because I want my opinion on them and my reaction to them when I've finished to be genuine and sincere. And I, th- I think I'd lose that if I pre-read them because I'd know what was coming. Then I'd have to try and fake what my initial reaction was. But the title of the next email, I'm intrigued by and it gives me shivers. So there's a good chance we're all going to get a bit of a scare from this. We're all going to get a bit petrified from this email because listen to the title. The title is, When My Daughter's Eyes Turned Black. Yes, maybe we should just stop it now, turn the lights on and go and have a coffee because I'm already scared. Yes. And this comes in from Kim. Hello, Kev. Hello, Kim. Becca. Hi. And Matt. Bloody hell, Matt. Tell you what. I'm sick of trying to do this Cockney voice. I just can't do it. It's so offensive. Oi. (laughs) Sound like Michael Barrymore if he's been winded. Anyway, it's me typing another epic on the phone with my thumbs. I promised to tell you this ages ago, but I've been reluctant to write it because it's so incredible. I'm worried some people will think I'm making it up. You don't need to worry about that here, Kim. Honestly. Where are we? It really is quite ridiculous, but I promise you it's all true. See, even that little sort of tease in, that gets my, you know, my blood bubbling to, for a good story. So oh, let's see what it is. It concerns my daughter, so that's another reason I hesitate to write. I don't mind you using my first name, but please leave my surname out to protect her identity. And of course we will, Kim. Here we go. Are we ready? Are we bracing ourselves? Have you got a neighbour on speed dial just in case you need them to come in and comfort you? Anyway, here we go. This is the story when my daughter's eyes turn black. It happened a few years ago. I don't remember exactly how many... It was around the time she was a preteen. My husband was working away and I was home alone with the kids, which wasn't unusual. They were all tucked away in bed and all was calm. I had just finished cleaning the kitchen and was about to go and sit down in the living room when my daughter started coming down the stairs. This was nothing strange because every night without fail she would sleepwalk and I could time my watch by it. One hour after she went to bed, She would come down, eyes open but vacant, and walk into every corner of the room like a ball bouncing around a pinball machine. She'd done it for years. At first, we were worried and would try to find out what she was doing and if she was okay. But over time, we learned that when she was in this state, we just had to say, go to bed, and her name, and she'd just do it without any drama. Much more compliant than when she was awake. Over time... We learned that we could head her off at the pass and send her back to bed as soon as she was on the stairs, without going through the motions of her bouncing off the corners of the room. It was a really bizarre ritual, but we were so used to it that it was our normal. She wasn't ever distressed or in need of anything when she was doing it. It was so weird. Bloody hilarious to hear the tales from the occasional family babysitters if we forgot to mention it before we went out. So, she's coming down the stairs... And I say, go to bed, and her name. She turns as usual to head back up the stairs, but stops after a few steps and starts coming back down. Now this was not usual. I asked what she needed, but there was no response, and as I was asking if she wanted a drink or something, she stared at me. And though I couldn't see her expression for the shadows, something made me catch myself inside and I felt a bit nervous. I told her to go to bed again, and I could hear a slight panic in my voice. This was also odd because it was like I was listening to myself as a third person. Anyway, she turned to go up, and I felt relief flood in my system. I could not understand my response at all, but no sooner that she turned, she made to come back down, and this time she was quite... I don't know confrontational, defiant, more than that, and something inside me was on high alert. I was also pretty annoyed and I shouted her this time to go back to bed and stop messing about and do what I say. The stairs are those kind that have two steps up onto a little landing and turn back on themselves before going up, like an L shape. 
The banister is spindles, so you can see all the way up from the bottom, and that's where I was stood in the hall. She suddenly came down those stairs so fast I hardly seen her move. She stood on the little landing facing me, and I will never, ever, in all my days, forget what I saw or what happened next. Because she was two steps up, her face was level with mine, and she came right up to my face. Her eyes were black. I don't mean dilated pupils, I mean all black, even the corneas. The veins in her forehead protruded, and she was a bit flushed. In brackets, she normally has sky blue eyes, very pale skin, and white hair. This was no trick of the light, which was on, by the way. She came right to my face, and I swear to God, her jaw opened like a maw. Like you see in those horror movies. I never thought it was possible, but it is. It dropped so far down and distorted into the most horrible, elongated maw, and this blood-chilling sound came out of it. I really can't describe to you what it was because I never heard the like. The closest I can think of was a mix between a growl and anger and frustration, and I don't know what. It was unearthly, really. I absolutely shit myself, those eyes staring into me. I glanced away and saw her hand balled into a fist and all the veins popping out up to the elbow, and again it was distorted. It wasn't the arm of a little girl. The veins were massive, like you see on bodybuilders, and there was so much tension the arm was shaking. Have you ever had one of those moments where your brain temporarily disconnects so you can process what your eyes are telling you? They seem to take forever, but it's probably only a second or two. As this was happening, I was fighting the abject terror that was rising in me, and somehow I managed, not to overcome it entirely, but to put it aside and let the fear carry on in a separate part of myself whilst I thought what I could do. I couldn't call the husband to help. I was alone and had to think on my feet. I had turned my back on conventional religion years ago and have my own spiritual practice and beliefs, but I always kept my friendship with Jesus. So, I reverted to type and prayed like a zealot on fire. The Lord's Prayer, the prayer to St. Michael, some half-remembered liturgy, any psalm that came to me. In between, I was ranting at it to get out of my daughter, to get out of my house, leave my daughter alone. I saw that whatever it was was inside her, and it became slightly subdued, and this gave me a little breathing space to calm down. Then, the weirdest thing of all happened. As I looked into its eyes, I began to feel compassion. Don't get me wrong, I was still bricking it. I can't convey just how terrifying I was. But a shift came over me, and I could almost connect to its pain, or whatever hopelessness it was feeling. I began to see it not as something that needed to be cast into hell, but as part of God's creation, albeit a fucking scary one but life nonetheless, and for whatever reason, it was manifest. The all created all and is all, so who am I to question why these things exist? I softened my tone and started to talk to it. I reasoned with it. I said, there is a place where it belongs and it can be loved, but it's not here. I told it it has to leave and go to the best place for it where it will be happy. I said it can't stay here, and it has to leave my daughter and this house. I probably spouted some trite stuff about the light. I don't know what was coming out of my mouth at that point. It was all becoming very surreal. I escorted it to the kitchen, where I put some salt on my daughter's head, and then I opened the door and said again, it has to leave. Leave my daughter, leave this house. It has to go where it belongs and to go with our blessings. Then, I put my daughter out of the house. I grabbed the salt and I laid a line across the doorstep. I ran to the back door and did the same, then ran back to my daughter. It was a risky move putting her out there, but I felt that's what I had to do, and she was there no more than a minute. When I went back, she was just standing there, where I put her, as right as a bobbin. Her eyes were normal, 
She looked a bit dazed. I took her hand and brought her in and asked if she was okay. She didn't remember a thing. She didn't know about anything that had happened. It was all so mental. I helped her up to bed and she didn't come back down that night and in the morning when I asked her she still didn't know anything had happened at all. Not even me putting her back to bed. I didn't tell her anything about it. Now, before I go, I want to make sure to say I'm not a fire and brimstone fanatic that sees demons to be cast down at every turn. Because I realise how this story may sound to some people who don't know me. I'm not one to call for two priests and a bucket of holy water just because my kids act out. Although I'm a believer in the paranormal, I'm also quite sceptical and grounded. I don't jump at every bump, and even when something is probably a spirit, these days it's not even such a drama if it leaves us alone. Nothing like this has ever happened again, and I hope that whatever it was found peace and never return, or sent its mates or its big brother round. Thanks for reading. I hope you understand now why I was reluctant to tell. I'm glad I have. I hope by telling my story, I help people to overcome fear, to keep calm and see things from a different angle. As terrifying as this experience was, I really learned a lot and it was invaluable. Love, compassion and understanding really is the way forward. Take care and God bless. Kim Oh my Jeffing Jeffrey Jesus tonight. What in the blue hell happened to your daughter? Oh my God. I got carried away in reading that because I could visualise it so well in my brain. And because it was very well written, in truth, that's why. So well done you, Kim. But I think I speak on behalf of all of us. And I think we can all agree the bride is shitting herself. Because that is amazing. Terrifying and amazing. And how you managed to be that composed and be that reasonable and see bloody empathy and have empathy and compassion for this thing that is distorting your daughter's jaw and making her growl and shake and veins popping out i mean i know you say you wouldn't you're not the sort to go and get two priests but frig me if there was one occasion where that required priests by the busload i would literally have to phone four ubers and just say can you bring me all the priests you can please there would i would have to go out to costco and get a load of bagels or something because there would be a lot of priests in the house oh my god and you know what you must have some sort of um grounding or idea in the paranormal in terms of uh dealing with entities because not a lot of people understand the alleged power of salt um to keep a protection circle and stuff like that especially to do something like that it's just an amazing story i mean to be honest the Every time that I said the word more, M-A-W, I know what you mean. And for those who don't know what um, Kim meant in that story, picture like, um, is it Momo? Google Momo and you'll see it's like a big elongated bird face. But know what you mean. It's kind of like if you imagine, you've seen, definitely seen it in horror films. It's like as if the jaw disconnects and it drops right down. But couple that with black eyes and it's your daughter. That's the most terrifying part. You know what it does remind me of? There's an amazing book. It's years old now. It's over a decade old. So it's not really a spoiler when I say this because it's been out forever. And also, not only that, it's still 100% worth getting this book because of everything else that happens within it. This is just a minuscule part of it. But there's a book called Will Store vs. The Supernatural, and you should buy it. He's a journalist, a genuine real-life journalist, and not a believer in the paranormal. And he was commissioned to write an article for a lads mag in the UK around Halloween. So he does it, and he goes and meets this demonologist fella, a guy you might have heard on heard of even in the paranormal community called Lou Gentile. He's actually dead now, sadly. But he goes and meets him and everything. He experiences stuff that he decides, this isn't going to be an article. This is going to be a book. And it's just amazing. He he goes on set with Most Haunted. He does loads. It's just such a good ride. It takes you from believe it's a skeptic, believe it's a skeptic, all the way through. Buy this book. You can get it on Amazon for like $2.99 or something. And it's worth it. Will Store versus The Supernatural. Anyway, the point that I'm trying to get to there's a really great part of this book where 
he is in America. He's with this guy who says he's an exorcist. And the exorcist guy says, we're going to do an exorcism on this lady. He goes, fair enough. Um, they turn up at this woman's house. I won't give the full spoiler, but anyway, um, he the, the exorcist explains to Will Storr that salt, getting back to Kim's story, has this magical power to like stop evil passing it and all this carry on. And he says, and this is very special salt. This has been blessed by the church, blah, blah, blah. So Will Storr, the journalist, a skeptical journalist, um, on her in the story, the woman says that the evil is coming in through a portal in her closet, in her bedroom. And they're downstairs and she's telling them all this. And he manages to swipe some of the, sorry, that's our door, some of the salt. And he sneaks upstairs and lays it outside the, the, um, the closet. He sneaks it on there and only he knows he's done it. They go back a week later. The woman answers the door, all frantic-eyed. And when he goes upstairs, she's been scrubbing bleach at that spot. Only he knew he'd done it, and it kind of hidden itself in the carpet. But she knew, and that's how it kind of validates her being possessed. Anyway, we could go on for hours about that. But Kim, what a story! Don't forget, guys, if you've got a story that you want to share, send it in to contact at talkaboutghosts dot com. If you want to listen to two extra episodes each and every week, head over to patreon dot com forward slash We Need to Talk About Ghosts. In the meantime, and in between time, as Jeremy Springer said in the mid nineties, take care of yourselves and each other. Daddy, bye.